I'm here with my dear friend, Laura Shipler Chico, who's joining me from London uh, in the UK. I'm in Oregon. And I've known Laura for many, many years. Um, and I wanted to interview her um, because she has been involved in uh, peace building work for many years uh, all over the world. And, uh, and she's also involved in theater as an actor now. Um, so with this work that I've been working on for over the past 10 years um, that the Elsewhere Ensemble is about to present, uh, Invocation, A Prayer for Peace, um, I thought it was uh, interesting and important to hear and connect about Laura's own kind of personal experience of working in peace building in a concrete way um, and her connection with being an artist and that work and let's let's get started. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you so much for in inviting me to do this. And yeah, it's exciting. I actually started working on invocation when I was spending time in London and I would hang out at the Quaker um, bookstore and cafe. And I wrote some of my first drafts of the piece there. And Laura introduced me to this cafe because she was working there and um, not at the cafe. She was working, <laughs> working with the uh, Quakers and working with peace uh, building in, working in East Africa, mostly. Yes, yep. And so why don't you tell us a little bit about um, how you got involved in peace building, how, and a little bit of your journey and what you've been working on in the last sure. <laughs> many years. Sure. Well, it's, first of all, it's such a pleasure to be invited into this and to, to be able to have learned a bit about your incredible piece and that you what that you've been working on and as you said I've been hearing about it over the years too and um and and since you're such a, a dear friend who's been a part of my own artistic journey um it's really nice to to be able to um have this interview so thank you so much um in terms of my own personal kind of journey into peace building, I think it probably on reflection started right from the very, very beginning of my life. Because when I was eight months old, I, my um, parents picked me up from New York City, where I'd been born and moved to Saigon in Vietnam, now called Ho Chi Minh City, um, in the middle of the um, Vietnam American War, because my father was um, a journalist there from the New York Times. And then after that, we moved to Moscow in the middle of the Cold War, then to Jerusalem. So essentially, my childhood was all about living in conflict zones, but I was living with parents who were, who would have the ability to really, and the, and the curiosity to really try to see and understand people who were involved in the conflict from many, many different angles. And so I think I grew up with that natural desire to connect and understand, but also empathy for um, people who were directly affected by conflict. Um, and because I knew people um, mm -hmm. from, from when I was a child. So as an adult, um, I was drawn to um, working in some of these kinds of um, contexts, first in the United States, actually, because there are many conflict-ridden um, parts of the United States. And uh, well, now we could even say the, the whole country is sort of embroiled and, um, and people who have been affected by violence. And then I moved to um, other countries as well. Can you tell me a few of those different, the important kind of places where you were and what you were doing? Sure. Um, so I, so after working in the U.S. for a while, first on um, actually on racial justice and um, diversity, equity, and inclusion, I then moved into looking at the, doing a program called the Help Increase the Peace Program with Quakers. Um, in, in nationally in the U.S., working with young people who literally many of them were in schools where their friends had to carry guns to 
get to school safely and then they would stash them in the you know in bushes or something and then pick them up after school that was really eye-opening for me how people were so affected by violence in some parts of the country and how how what a spirit there was among many of these young people for really trying to change things and really work for peace and I found that really inspiring and um I then um decided to uh go to Thailand to work on the um, Myanmar Thailand border um, at <clears throat> within the Myanmar democracy movement and actually within the women's movement within the democracy movement and what they invited me to do was um, they had set up a women's association which for it was the first of its kind to actually bring together people of different ethnic groups from within Myanmar, all these political exiles, students, refugees, who were trying to struggle for democracy in their home country. And many of them hadn't interacted across ethnic lines before. And um, I managed to connect with these folks and they invited me to work with them. And that was a really incredible experience that maybe we'll draw on stories from later. Mm -hmm. um, and then after that, I, one thing I learned from that was that, um, you know, in order, if I wanted to do peace building, I needed to understand what is the impact of violence on people. So I went to um, social work school and I specialized in trauma and trauma recovery. And then with that um, sort of background, I then was lucky enough to um, go to Rwanda. That was about 10 years after the genocide there. And I worked with um, a local organization that was bringing together Hutu and Tutsi um, survivors and perpetrators or family members of perpetrators um, together for kind of collective trauma recovery. Mm. And um, that, and I then ended up doing more similar work in Burundi. Um, so, and th those two experiences, the one on the Myanmar Thailand border and the one in Rwanda and Burundi were like deeply transformational experiences to me because what I um, discovered was the, the, the drive of kind of human nature the, the kind of the drive to um, to become whole and to mm -hmm. try to connect with those that we might be in profound conflict with um, is very deep and very real. And I was um, really privileged to get to work with some incredible humans and still have call them as friends. That's amazing. What 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 were some of the kind of scariest situations you found yourself yourself in or you felt if you felt exposed to a kind of violence that you weren't familiar with um was there any well I'm I'm I've lived a extremely blessed life I mean I don't I don't have a lot of you know war stories. There certainly have been moments where I've been you know in in I was in Burundi at a very tense time. I you know I heard gunshots in Congo, et cetera. But actually, what those what those moments showed me, I was never felt personally in danger, but I was very aware of um, my friends and colleagues who were um, who were from those places being more potentially targets than me in those types and those conflicts, which are often um, very kind of um, uh, determine, well, the, 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 the dangers are often more around some identities that are local rather than sort of international. So um, I remember in Burundi, there was a time, it's a very complicated history, but there was a moment that I was there when the president had announced um, that he was going to run for a third term, which was against the constitution. And it had, and Burundi had been in an uneasy peace after decades of civil war for two of these president's terms. And now this third, this announcement, people were terrified that it was going to provoke 
a return to the Civil War. And I, I, even though I had visited Burundi many times and worked there a lot, what I realized in the tent, I mean, the tension was so thick. I was on high alert. We were, you know, it was, um, it was like the, you know, felt like the calm before the storm. And what I saw then was how deep the trauma went in people, mm -hmm. how, um, uh, the, the fear around me really made an impact on me. Um, because I suddenly saw in a new way, even though I had heard stories about horrible things that had happened and acts of bravery during that time, um, I guess I just witnessed it in a different way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I can imagine when you're working with people who are affected by the kind of trauma of extreme violence that a lot of these people have been affected. Um, it must come out in the work with people too. I mean, you must experience some of that violence, even if it's not happening externally. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about that. Well, actually in, you know, in Rwanda, I think things have really changed, but that was only 10 years after the genocide. And in Rwanda, I really experienced um, collective trauma. Mm -hmm. You could feel it in the society. There would be times you would walk out and things felt a bit better and, you know, higher. And then other times when something just felt heavy and it was like a shared trauma in addition to the um into in addition to individual struggles which i which was also something that i had never thought about before i always thought about um trauma i was in my training it was really very individualistic and here i was in a entire society that was literally more than decimated if the if the definition is one out of 10 people killed it was more than that it was more like one out of eight people killed which is absolutely unfathomable um so uh so that certainly um, takes its toll, absolutely. And I definitely experienced um, secondary trauma and, and some burnout, you know, to the point where by the time we left, I really needed to cushion myself for a while from any of the bads in the world. Whereas before I really believed, and I do normally believe in the importance and the power of bearing witness in whatever way we can from whatever corner we're sitting in in the world of bearing witness and looking unflinchingly. Um, I think we need to do that. Mm -hmm. But for a while I had to kind of protect myself. But I have to say that having said that, um, uh, the, the, the many of the people I know, and I hopefully I'll have a chance to tell some more of those stories, but, or just that um, so many of them, the peace builders were doing what they were doing, not in spite of their trauma, mm. but because of it, they were better at what they were doing because of what they've been through. And some of my friends that I made are the most um, connecting, empathetic humans that I've ever, ever known. And I've never, I've ever met. And they, there was no, there was not the comparison, you know, that we can sometimes do in our slightly more pampered lives of, well, you think that's bad. I'm going through this, you know, even if we never say it out loud or my, my trauma. So it's nothing, you know, because of Mm -hmm. compared to all these other people, you know, that kind of comparison that we do. Well, the people that I knew in Rwanda, they didn't do any of that. Human pain was human pain. No mm -hmm. one was comparing. And it, I found that really, um, what I found that like, I don't know. <laughs> I get when I, if you say the word inspiring, it's a bit, mm -hmm. so I'm not sure what the word is, but it, but it grew me. Mm -hmm. Well, are there any specific stories or experiences that uh, kind of gave you um, a sense of hope in the midst of, you know, situations that seem maybe objectively hopeless or an experience specifically in your work um, that, yeah, that really 
again, to use the word inspired you, but also helped you to grow and surprised you in a, in a way that, that connected you more with people and a sense of hope that uh, transformation and reconciliation and growing towards something, a more peaceful world was possible? Well, I mean, uh, Rwanda is filled with these stories. There, there's one after another after another. I mean, but one of the people that I was just thinking about when I was answering your previous question was my friend Solange, um, who was, I think she was 13 at the time of the genocide. Um, she lost most of her family members. She, there were a few people who survived. She witnessed her um, father being killed in a very um, gruesome way um, inside their house. And so the, the genocidaires climbed in through the roof. They got in. And she was hiding with her sister. They killed the dad. And one of the genocidaires turned around and said to the girls, get out, get out. So Rwanda's full of these, um, I'll tell you what I, this is not the hopeful story that I want to tell you. I will tell you one about her in a minute, but Rwanda's filled with these contradictions. There's like, there are no heroes there, mm -hmm. but there, but there are a lot of stories of people who, I mean, I say there are no heroes because it, it was very, it's very hard in that context to be pure. Your, your people had to make choices in the moment. And the same people who might have saved lives also um, were killed. And so it's very complicated, but there's, I went to a genocide memorial um, in a church. And I remember over the kind of doorway, um, there was a quote, I think it's actually from the Quran, but it says to save one life is to save the entire world. And I really get that because so many of the of the genocide survivors that I worked with in Rwanda who were peace builders themselves, they were there and alive because their lives had been saved by a Hutu person, mm -hmm. right? So there was that complicated. So she said, I wish I could meet that man who saved me. And I was thinking like, if you met him, what would you say? Like, what are you focused on when you say that, that he killed your father or that he saved your life? So, but later she's got, she went on to become a, a very skilled and wonderful facilitator of trauma recovery workshops, et cetera. And these were, these workshops would bring together because when we lived that, when I lived there, it was a time when um, genocidaires who had been imprisoned were being released and coming out into the community. And there was a process through, called gachacha, which was like these court processes that were community-based. Gachacha literally means like under the shade of a tree, these sort of community-based courts where people were, um, would, uh, the less serious crimes. So um, would be heard by these like community courts. And um, so she, it, through one of these workshops, in these workshops, some of these released prisoners were coming to the workshops, right? Because they were coming and living back in and among people sometimes that they had maybe tried to kill or rob from or whatever. And um, there was in there a released prisoner who had been accused of, of um, genocide crimes. <clears throat> and coming back after 10 years in prison was also not easy. You know, you come back, you find your wife had married other people, you found you didn't have your property, you found you were hated and feared, you were terrified of revenge killings. Um, so um, the he asked her after the workshop, can I come and talk to you a afterwards? And she was like, okay, she was scared he wanted to come and talk one-on-one -on -one with her, but she said, okay. So he came to visit her. I don't know if it was at her office or at her home. Um, and they sat and they talked and he told her about his troubles. Like he doesn't have any money. He doesn't have it. He, he can't get a job. He's like, you know, all these things that are difficult. And she listened 
And then at the end, she went, she got like the equivalent of 10 or $20 and she gave it to him to help. And he went, and I was like, Solange, how do you have, how can you do that? And she said, Laura, it is a gift to be trusted. It's a gift to be trusted. And she was refused to stay in her, in the victim role. She saw him as another human and um, reached out. So that's just one of many, 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 many stories that I had the privilege of learning when I was there. That's amazing. You talked about bearing witness a little earlier. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about what that means to you and, you know, what the average person, <laughs> how that could speak to someone who isn't necessarily actively involved in this work. Um, I think, I think one of the most important things as humans that that we have a responsibility to do, whether it's with a friend, with a partner, with a stranger, is um, the to develop enough strength within ourselves to be able to sit with pain. And you know, most people can't do that really, actually, because you know, we leap to fix it. We leap to say, don't cry, don't cry, don't cry, you know, to our little ones. And it's is it because we don't want we 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 think it's because we want them to be happy, but it's also because it makes us squirm to hear a child crying. It, it's hard for us. Um, but actually sitting with someone's pain and being willing to see it for what it was without trying to escape it um in some of these workshops in Rwanda participants at the end would literally say i feel lighter i came in so heavy i started to share and i feel lighter so as human beings i believe we do have the responsibility for one another to show up once in a while and to be willing to share some of those that load sometimes Sometimes we're in a position in our lot, in our own lives where we just can't, and that's fine too, you know, but I think it overall, we need to be willing to let it in. And in this day and age, it's, I find it very hard for myself and maybe other people do too. I find it so hard because this is one horrible thing after another, after another, after another, and I don't let it in most of the time. You know, I can't even, I used to pour over reports of school shootings and now I can't even remember the name of the latest school or whatever, you know, what is happening? I'm not letting it in. Um, so um, I think that's what I mean by bearing witness because, and, and one of the reasons it's important is one, it's sharing it, but also, um, how do I say this? It's like, I think this is maybe part of my Quaker influence as well, but I really believe that, so Quakers believe there's that of God in everybody. So that is actually a really challenging idea. That's a, there is that of, you don't have to say God if that doesn't resonate and it doesn't always resonate with me, but there is something knowing, there is something wise or something good. There's some current something in every person. And that we're supposed to walk the world speaking to that of God and everyone. That's the challenge, which obviously we always fall <laughs> short of. Um, so I sometimes think that when you're willing to kind of see into the pain or sit or dwell deep, as um, one Quaker writer once said, dwell deep in that um, you find that light. So you willing to walk into the darkness and you find that light um, and you see it. And I certainly had that experience um, in Rwanda of seeing that or look, at least look for the light. Maybe mm -hmm. that's better. You don't always find it, but you look for it. So yeah, something you, you said about um, just people being just 
all the difficult stories in the world now being very overwhelming and not being able to take it in. Um, as I work on this piece and, and present it and try and get people interested in listening to it, I feel like that's a fear I have that they just don't want to go there. They don't want to deal with this. But on the other hand, um, one of the reasons I created this piece is because there are people from across time and cultures who have said words, but words that were inhabited, I think that words that were lived, um, that also do give us hope and give us strength. And so when you're talking about um, bearing witness, I was thinking that it's also important to bear witness to um, these instances of hope and transformation. Absolutely, you're right. You're so right. I can't <laughs> believe I went only down the... <laughs> well, I was, I was guiding you down that path too, but... Yeah, no, but yeah, <clears throat> absolutely. So what are some of the things that actually do the, maybe words or people or or lived experiences that actually enable you then to you know have that strength and that hope and um ability power to open up to to things later that are that are difficult mm. well i mean i think that witnessing there was somebody else in Rwanda who literally, I think he lost 97 members of his family. I couldn't go on a road trip with him in Rwanda without passing a church where he said, my uncle was killed there, my cousins were killed there, et cetera. And um, when, if he were to sit down and talk to you about, you know, those returning prisoners who were coming back, he he would start talking about everything that they were going through, the, you know, the the hardships and um you know, the shame and the pain and the fear, et cetera. If you just listened to him, you would think he was one of them, like in his degree of empathy. So I find that amazing, you know, and I see now some of the divisions. I mean, I know, I know I'm not living in the States right now, but I am aware and sad about, you know, the, the degree, how divided the country has become and how, um, in many spaces, it seems to become have become impossible for people to hear each other's perspectives without labeling, without you know shaming or um, and that makes me sad because I've seen people who've gone through much more extreme, you know, um, well, I don't want to start doing the comparison thing. that's a trap. But I mean, I've seen people who've gone through extreme things. Um, who somehow seem to have been able to transcend that. So for me, I think if I were, if I had just been sitting in some office, like reading these different stories of like horrors that happened to people, I would have given, I would have like really burnt out fast. Mm -hmm. But because I was living in a, in a vibrant community where I couldn't walk more than a few minutes without being stopped and you know, talked to by this person or that person, because I saw people with very little helping people with even less all the time, all the time, you know, because I saw like people dancing and praising God and, you know, doing what people do, like, you know, finding lots of, you know, just um, being vibrant as humans, you know, um, in spite of what they had gone through or sometimes because of what they've gone through um that is very nourishing that's very nourishing now in my current life i think the um i do believe that we need doorways into that so i i think that's like the golden thread that ties my current acting with the peace building work because i think um i really believe in inspiring the emotional imagination of people mm. and that art and theater and, you know, literature and music are ways of kind of tapping into something that enables us to connect outside of our own lived experience with other people's um, experiences. And I love being able to inhabit characters and truly try to imagine a whole different set of circumstances and draw um 
an audience along with me so that even if who I'm portraying is someone that norm in normal life, they would completely judge or discount by the end. Maybe they can't help, but care a little bit. Mm. I love that. <laughs> so yeah, I'm going on with that, like, um, yeah, what has, uh, because you've, you've always, you always acted, uh, in school before, right? When you and in then, high school, I did, school, yeah. yeah, and in college. <laughs> well, just that one play, Colin. <laughs> uh, but um, but then you've come into acting uh, professionally um, in what the last ten five years? years, five years, five, five yeah. years, five years. Well, five years of professional acting, and then two years before that of drama school. So, so what has that revealed to you? about your previous work or what has it, is there any way that they've connected that has been interesting for you? And, and what has it taught you that maybe you didn't get out of the peace building work? I'm saying previous, but you're still continuing with that work too. So, yeah. Um, well, there are a lot of, I mean, some that are probably less like deeply spiritual, <laughs> you know, in terms of your, I mean, one is obviously the the um, industries are so different because I came from a very value-driven industry where what's inside is what counts. And now I'm in a much, a very different kind of a very, an industry full of paradoxes because actually artists and creatives are going to be among the most, you know, kind of tender souls out there. Um, and yet to make a living in it, you certainly need to, um, focus it's very focused on the external shell of of who you are because there's so much talent there's so many people who can play a part I mean that is one thing I really learned there is an abundance of incredible talent it's very inspiring but also you know frustrating <laughs> when you're trying to get apart um but <clears throat> so that so the industries are are really different but I think that I'm, I feel really lucky in my acting because I've sometimes I've played parts where, for example, a mother who's lost a child and is talking about that or someone who's gone through some sort of um, trauma or something like that. And I can be informed by the wholeness of the people that I know personally so, because sometimes people might be tempted to to play some of those characters, like, oh, man, I lost my child. but you act, but actually, usually, when people have gone through really hard things, they are much. It's much more nuanced, and and sometimes filled with humor, sometimes filled with, you know, um, uh, stoicism, matter of fact. You know, people people have all sorts of different shades and, and how they react. And I think I'm so, so lucky to have come to acting after like such a rich life of experiences and connections with people from so many different, um, you know, contexts and circumstances, because I feel that like reservoir um, to tap into, which is really good. And do you, do you think that art then does have a role in helping to change people, change the world? Um, I think art is, is probably one of the biggest forces that does actually. I mean, often for the worse instead of for the better. It, you know, it depends on like how, how it's used. Um, I, I do actually think there's sort of, I'm hoping there's kind of an, an awakening now or a there's a shift in, in what kinds of things are being um, funded and enabled. Um, but I do think, um, you know, I, with some of the work that I do is, is in like diversity, equity, and inclusion. And we talk a lot about, you know, how to get leaders buy-in to make changes in your organization. And, you know, we talk about, you have to influence the, the mind, yes, but also the head, but also the heart. And that actually research shows that stories stay with people and change people much, much more than facts. So mm -hmm. it, 
you don't, it doesn't work to maybe only tug at heartstrings. If you want systemic change, you need to make, you know, you need to find the lever points and rational, um, the rationale for change, et cetera. But fundamentally as humans, I do believe we all seek connection and we all have that capacity for empathy, maybe to varying degrees, but it can be tapped into for everyone. And I think art, um, whether it's theater, whether it's music, whether it's film, whether it's literature, that has the um, that has the potential to. That's certainly how I was formed. I'm especially reading books mm-hmm. by authors who are not white American women that would like, I would read authors all the time who were not necessarily me. And you know, there's that saying you read to know, to know that you're not alone. That's true because when you read, you learn, when you read outside of your own um, reality, you learn so much about other, um, other experiences, other realities, but you also find that, that thread that connects you with who you're reading about. Oh, 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 wait, any good, you know, book will will have a universality to it as well. So we know as humans, there's the universality and the specific. And I think art is like nothing else in a time, in an era when we're completely overwhelmed and we do shut down, art is the doorway Mm -hmm. to connect us to um, our humanity, our shared humanity. If there were something that you would hope that as humans, we might learn uh, (laughs) what, like in the next years, what would you hope that would be, that would be, that would help the world and help change some of the things that you've experienced and witnessed? Um... We are no better and no worse than anybody else. No better and no worse. People don't believe that yet. And I really think, um, wouldn't it be amazing if we could raise a generation that actually knew, it's not, it, no, it's a fact. We are no better, no worse than anybody else, but we have this internalized hierarchy in our mind. And so we, and we're constantly projecting bad onto other people to make ourselves feel better, or we're bringing ourselves lower because we've been somehow taught that we're not. And, um, and it, it makes us not care. So the only time it, the news does penetrate us is when people look, you know, either like us or like who we've been taught to care about, which is sometimes not ourselves, depending on who you are, you know, your identity. So, um, yeah, that for me, that would be a start. That would be a good start. Mm -hmm. (laughs) That, that really connects with, um, yeah, what started this piece of invocation, um, for me, this, this phrase out of, the Russell Einstein manifesto, we implore you as human beings to human beings, remember your humanity and forget yeah. the rest. And, mm-hmm. and that's what it said to me in a way is that, yes, this, can we just start at that point that every single one of us has this common humanity? Um, and that's different from the people are people because what that does is it diminishes the realities of racism and oppression and discrimination and marginalization. But what you're saying is something that goes much deeper. And it makes me think of a quote that I, another quote I saw at a genocide memorial, which really um, touched me as being full of so much hope, actually. It said, um, if you really knew me, and you really knew yourself, you would not have done this. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, and I think um, 
what you're bringing out to is in that quote that I just said, there is, there is the danger of reading it as, um, you know, oh, we're all the same and, and what you're upset about, you know, <laughs> diminishing. Right, that's how it's often used. Yeah. yeah but I, I guess what hit me was this idea of remember your humanity that like, in the sense of what you're saying, that I am that's capable right. of the same good and the same horrible people. Yeah. People that each and every one of us is capable yeah. of and that we we've never we're, I feel like we've never we're never saved from that completely like we can we can go into one or the other and I think some of the stories you've told uh, already in this today is kind of an example of that that people who have been in extreme collective trauma have slipped into some in an extreme generosity of and uh, connection to people who logically they shouldn't. <laughs> right. And yeah, and and also it's sort of we we're all capable of those things. And then the other part is like we that wouldn't it be amazing if we actually believe that each life was equally valuable. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I've done work in. Congo, where I helped with a project on um, an early warning, early response system in, in, a, in a province in eastern Congo. And in the eight months that I worked there, I'd have to double check the statistics, but definitely over a thousand people were killed in this one province. And it never once made the news internationally until the um, Italian ambassador was assassinated. Yeah. So enough to make your blood boil. Yeah. Um, anything, anything that um, you think um, maybe the, the average person who doesn't have any kind of connection to peace building work, um, anything that they might any misconceptions they might have about it or um you know what though i think everybody has a connection to peace building work it's just not it's the same way as you know saying i think i heard marlon brando saying well everybody's an actor yeah. everyone's an actor we're always acting all the time it's like oh yeah <laughs> and good actors actually really good <laughs> everyone is really good um and it's actually kind of true with peace building because i think what i've learned and i for a while i felt like even though i was doing this work in communities i was sort of like on the fringes of peace building because the peace building sector and you know all of that and it had become very professionalized and then i i've kind of like come to realize that actually like peace building is it's about relationships it, it, it is about structures as well maybe it's at the intersection of you know you know, personal relationships and, and then systems and structures. So it's not that those don't matter, but um, maybe a, a misconception is that peace building is something out there, but actually peace building is constant. So, you know, depending on who the audience of this is like, you know, how do you talk to your kids about, um, you know, how do you talk to your kids about their unearned privileges? Because no matter how, because everybody actually has some unarmed privilege most people have some some unarmed privilege so how do you make them aware of that how are you raising responsible people you know how what do you I think that's all that's a part of that's peace building mm -hmm. that's peace you know how how are you um exercising empathy in your life with your partner which is harder sometimes than empathizing with like <laughs> your political enemy you know so that's what I'm like not necessarily good at you know do all this peace building out there and I think oh gosh you know I've got a lot in, inside to work on so you know we peace building is actually not something that's remote at all it's as connected to us as you know anything else that we do on a daily basis yeah any any last thoughts before we conclude or Anything else you'd like to share that you didn't get a chance to? Um, I've just really enjoyed this conversation. It's bringing me back to myself. It's tying little threads of myself together, reminding me. So, And I'm so um, 
really excited about this piece of work um, that that Elsewhere Ensemble is doing. I just think it's it's beautiful. It's a beautiful concept because the you know obviously with peace building you often have to go deep into the particularities of whatever conflict, but and there are there are specificities and there are cultural dimensions or whatever. But what you've done with this piece is that you're sort of gathering these like little gems of wisdom from all over the world, from different traditions, from different religious faiths to remind us that there is this overarching, you know, yearning um, for one another. And I really um, look forward to the day when I can be sitting in the audience and letting it wash over me. Well, thank you. That was very beautiful to hear. <laughs> <laughs> Well, th this was absolutely wonderful. Um, and yeah, thank you so much. And I hope that we can actually, yeah, do maybe a live interview after a concert or. Oh, that would be really exciting. Yeah. Somewhere in the world. Yeah. So.